Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali is the ninth and current president of the Republic of Guyana. The son of educators, President Ali first became a member of the National Assembly of Guyana in 2006 and was subsequently appointed to key leadership roles focused on housing, water, tourism, and commerce. During his consequential time at the Ministry of Housing, President Ali implemented the most extensive endowment campaign in the history of his country, including a significant distribution of lots to citizens of all socioeconomic status and geographic region. President Ali has led Guyana through one of the most consequential times in its history as the fastest growing economy in the world, but also has faced significant challenges over a territorial dispute with Venezuela over the Esquibo region that made headlines around the world in October 2023. President Ali, welcome to the Swift Hour. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be with you and the Concordia family. And I'm very happy to be here. Mr. President, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, your objectives uh, for the UN General Assembly and for this fall within the global community from Guyana. Um, where do you see Guyana's role evolving in a more global context? Well, you know, uh, first of all, I just want to make a little adjustment to your opening statement. Please. Uh, we don't see uh, the Esquibo as a dispute. Uh, Venezuela has raised a controversy, and this is before the ICJ now. And uh, we are very pleased that Venezuela is participating in the ICJ. And uh, as we will do, we call on all parties to respect the outcome of the ICJ. Now, Guyana, as you know, is growing at a very rapid pace. In the first half of this year, we are growing at about 49%. Um, the non-oil economy is growing at more than 12%. And many people associate Guyana now, especially those who are now uh, tuning in to Guyana and development that is taking place in Guyana. They're associating Guyana with oil and gas. But uh, this is just one component of the diversified uh, development and investment portfolio that we possess in Guyana. We're a country, of course, that is not, uh, rich in natural resources, the latest being oil and gas. Uh, but historically, we have been uh, a major uh, player in the bauxite, gold uh, industries. Uh, we have a lot of silica sand that uh, we, we uh, trade with within the region. The country is very, very rich in terms of ecotourism potential. One of the difficulties we've had over the years is how do we transfer that potential into reality? And that was a uh, consequential effect of limited resources. Uh, that were not there to build infrastructure and expand infrastructure and create the opportunities for a new economy, an economy in which we can have a competitive advantage in, uh, in food, in climate, in security, and I'll come back to climate because we believe that we can have an important, uh, that climate and environmental services, ecosystem services can be an important part of this economy that we are building and diversifying. So uh, Guyana is being built out now on a very diverse and diversified platform. Now, on, in relation to food security, for example, we have abundant fresh water. Uh, we have also tremendous arable land, and we now want to use this potential uh, with the aid of technology uh, to be the major uh, producer of food within the region, and also to look at specialized production uh, for extra regional uh, supply. Uh, we are also heavily integrated, and we want to be even more integrated uh, with Brazil. So the investment in infrastructure to a roadway and a deep water port uh, to expand uh, opportunities for northern Brazil and to connect uh, northern Brazil with Guyana and to the Guyana Shield is an important part of what we are building. We have a working group with, with uh, President Lula, his team in Brazil, uh, to, to ensure that this project uh, is, is completed. The first phase of that road connection is under construction now by a Brazilian company. So transport and logistics, uh, food, energy, climate services, ecosystem services, biodiversity services, expansion of manufacturing and industrial development. The new industries, for example, we're looking at uh, excess power being uh, used now because for one, we'll have more power we're investing in and cheaper power to be used for the establishment of data centers, building a knowledge economy, expanding on the creative industry, centers of innovation, building a uh, a, future, a futuristic economy and building into the future now. But we can't do this on a straight line. So we're adopting the best technologies, ensuring that our people have the best access to healthcare and education. These are some of the priorities that we're focusing on. 
So outside of the oil and gas story that's being told all, all over, I just want to focus on two other stories. One is the low carbon development strategy. Our entire development is, uh, is captured in a low carbon development strategy. And that is because one of our greatest assets of our, is our forests. And that forest, of course, is part of an ecosystem that constitutes part of the oldest biodiversity zones in the world and one of the richest biodiversity zones. So one, we have the forest. That forest is there um, and, and a major component of the low carbon development strategy. The forest is the size of England and Scotland combined. It stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon. Uh, the forest, uh, as I said, um, we have developed a market-based mechanism to value the, the carbon footprint of the, the forest and what it does in terms of helping the planet, saving the environment. Uh, so we have these car uh, carbon credit schemes. We are, we, the entire forest is R3 certified, so we have the highest quality market that we can enter into, um, and that is for the aviation sector. Our, our carbon credits can be sold on the aviation sector. We have the lowest deforestation rate in the world, and this is by design, this is by policy. Uh, we have a tremendous monitoring system. Uh, so the forest is a key component of that economy we want to build in the future, but more importantly, part of the global ecosystem that we are safeguarding to protect the world. So we, are, we have argued and convincingly, and we're leading the world on this now, we are also providing uh, export leadership on forest management and how to deploy tropical forests in the climate equation, in the carbon market. So we have, we're the first country to sign an end use agreement with Hess Corporation. Uh, for more than $700 million, and this is 30% of the credit, and most of it, a lot of it is legacy credit. Outside of that, we had a bilateral agreement to the Kingdom of Norway, and uh, in that agreement also was for uh, the uh, sale of carbon credit. Recently, uh, with uh, uh, Concordia, and we had some great work uh, together, uh, building a partnership, with, and, and President Duque is our partner also, we are, we are now working on the launching of a global alliance on biodiversity. That global uh, alliance on biodiversity, we want to build out so that we can bring the best stakeholders globally in the room uh, next year to develop the model and to work a market-based mechanism on how biodiversity must be valued and, how, uh, and the payment system for those uh, countries that is keeping its biodiversity intact and alive because, as you know, over the last uh, 50, 60 years, we have lost more than 60% of our biodiversity. And this is an important aspect in keeping the balance in, 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 in the environment and ensuring that the biodiversity is protected. Uh, but there must be a value to this. So we are working uh, on these, uh, this added component to the LCDS. So it's not only the forest, it's biodiversity and the whole ecosystem that surrounds that. I will say I've, I've been to your beautiful country. It is truly one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen uh, in my life, and the the forest is is a remarkable and and a place to be cherished, not just uh, regionally but globally for the important uh, role that it plays within the environment. When you have an economy that is growing at the rate that your economy is growing, here we celebrate two and a half percent. You're growing, as you said, in the oil and gas sector, forty percent, and other sectors, twelve percent. How do you balance that growth with other critical areas of society that require investment but take a long time to see the benefits of that implementation and democratic politics. How do you navigate those three all at the same time? Well, first of all, everything must be built on the rule of law and democracy. If you are not going to build a country on democracy and the rule of law, then you're destined to fail. Democracy and the rule of law are critical components in building a country that is sustainable, resilient, competitive, one in which there is investment confidence, and one in which the people of the country can enjoy the freedom and level of uh, service and dignity and prosperity can come in a way that is dignified. There's only one way to do that, by ensuring your country remains democratic, strongly democratic, where all freedoms are enjoyed, and also the rule of law. That is the foundation of what we're building on. Now, how are we achieving this? It's a very important question because the growth of the country must be reflective in the service the country uh, can, can provide and will provide. We see our, our prosperity too as an important uh, 
benefit for the region because we want our prosperity to rebound to the prosperity of the region, the CARICOM region and beyond. So that's an uh, important um, uh, priority uh, for us. So what we are doing now is ensuring we build an economy that is diversified. We invest in people. We invest in our human resource base, upskilling the human resource asset, ensuring they have the best quality education, ensuring that they continue uh, along uh, educational pathway. We ensure that they have the best possible healthcare system, investing in healthcare, expanding healthcare, expanding social services, but targeted to vulnerable group, mm. uh, creating opportunities for young people, creating entrepreneurial opportunities, building uh, initiatives for small and medium-sized businesses, working in the financial sector to have financial reforms to support capital mobilization uh, for the medium and small businesses, whilst at the same time creating an enabling environment. Uh, so we are located in a very competitive geographic zone for manufacturing, industrial development, and agro-processing. Mm -hmm. Key to that is the cost of energy, which will come down by half in another couple of months, definitely before mid next year. So that's an that's, uh, important part of, of what we're going to do, bring down the cost of energy that will stimulate manufacturing, industrial development. And then, of course, uh, investment in agriculture farm to market access roads, opening up of new lands, using technology, better uh, scientific management of agriculture, supporting farmers, uh, expanding so uh, we will be self-sufficient in many areas that we were not self-sufficient in. Uh, we will save uh, hundreds of millions of US dollars in import in new agriculture areas that we are expanding into, targeting markets, specific market, for example, the prawns market in the US. We want to ensure that we invest to target that market. Uh, ecological services, uh, climate services. From uh, we believe that there is tremendous potential on the climate, on the carbon credit market. Once we continue to show that leadership and management in a way we are protecting our forests, that value must be transferred in country. Uh, <clears throat> the building out of the services sector, investment in uh, world class educational facility, looking at innovation, uh, uh, AI uh, digitization uh, in a way that ensures that all our people will have equal access and that that does not become the new area uh, to create divide because we are seeing this globally, uh, where uh, digitization is coming at a such a rapid pace that countries that cannot afford to, uh, to keep a pace will be further, uh, uh, the, that divide will be further expanded, the competitiveness will be further expanded. So we have to ensure that the digitization that comes does not expand uh, inequality but we invest now to ensure that there is a level platform. Are you developing public-private partnerships as a tool for to accomplish some of these things that you've just talked about? Public-private partnership is a very important aspect uh, of the work that we're doing. Expanding uh, public-private partnership is a key aspect of uh, building out the economy, but more importantly is creating an environment in which a private sector can grow. And that is what we're focused on I believe that the government must be that enabler of growth and development, uh, <clears throat> that creator of economic opportunity and investment opportunity. But the government has no role uh, to go after those opportunities. Those opportunities. The government's role is to create an enabling environment, a competitive environment, a policy-based environment that supports investment, that creates the opportunity for investment. And the policy is geared at creating that, uh, that environment for investors' confidence and to ensure that the private sector grow and expand to invite uh, new uh, uh, investors uh, from uh, all over the world uh, into the, the, the private sector to create an environment in which there is partnership between the more mature private sector and our local private sector that enables faster technology transfer, greater access to uh, capital formation. So these are the things that I think are key and that's the approach we're taking. Do you and talk a little bit, if you can, about Guyana's role in the Caribbean and 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 some of your regional objectives specific to the Caribbean at this time? So uh, you know we have an important role in Caricom because the seat of Caricom is in Guyana. The headquarters of Caricom is in Guyana, but Caricom is a is a network of of countries that uh, work together on the achievement of common goals and targets. For us in Guyana, we see ourselves as, first of all, we see our prosperity. 
as an opportunity to help our CARICOM brothers and sisters, to work closer with our CARICOM brothers and sisters so that we can have an integrated platform through which development will come throughout the region. Uh, so in transport and logistics, uh, food supply and food chain management, energy and, and, and using this energy potential that we have to uh, be a en net energy provider within the, the region, uh, especially with natural gas and the, uh, the value uh, creation from natural gas. That can be an integral part in the region. Food security, right? climate services, uh, human resource development, building out a healthcare system that can be effective and, and, and responsive to the region needs, an education system that may be ref reflective and responsive to the region needs. And of course, as the country continues to expand and you have all these multinationals and use cooperation coming in, we are seeing more and more regional, uh, uh, the regional private sector participating in the growth and expansion of the economy. We are seeing more regional citizens now working in Guyana. Uh, for a matter of fact, uh, most of the opportunities up to uh, recently were uh, being occupied by the private sector from Trinidad and Tobago, and that is because they had 100 years of oil experience. Now we're seeing greater integration with the private sector within the region and the local private sector. There is more consortiums that are being formed, more partnership, more joint ventures. Uh, so this is how uh, the region is becoming involved in, in the expansion and development. And that is CARICOM. And then we, of course, we have Brazil, uh, in which we're developing a very special relationship because uh, we want that integration in, in the infrastructure. We're even looking at the integration in the, of the energy grid and, and the, the the transport and logistics uh, kind, of, kind of business opportunities that will be created with the infrastructure we're investing in. Are you seeing, as you work on these regional alliances, are you seeing a significant shift currently in the role of the U.S., United States in the region versus a what seems to be an ever-expanding role of China? Well, I, I think there is a myth that we need to correct. Uh, historically, China has been playing a, uh, has played a major role in the region. Uh, and I can speak for Guyana, uh, for example. Uh, and that was because I think uh, there was not enough uh, focus on competition from other uh, players. Today, Chinese financing is not as expansive as it used to be. The cost of that financing is not the same as it was uh, years ago. In Guyana case, for example, most of our major infrastructure, well, yes, we have Chinese uh, companies operating, construction company, <clears throat> but almost all the major transformative big infrastructure project, the gas to shore project, is being done by an uh, American consortium. The, uh, the forest fairs of the road to Brazil uh, are uh, a Brazilian company. Um, so this, uh, we have many uh, US and, and global uh, multinationals operating, where is Lombardier, and, 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 and this is outside of Exxon and, and so on. So we have all these major transformative infrastructure. We have two Austrian company building out uh, the, the hospitals. Uh, two of the major hospitals, the child, uh, child, Women and Children Hospital and the New State of the Art Hospital in New Amsterdam. So this is where the, the, there's a shift that is taking place. Uh, we have, if you look at our uh, investment portfolio and, and finance availability portfolio today, we have more than 2.5 billion pounds made available by UKEF, the United Kingdom, uh, the, the UKEF. We have a, a sovereign uh, loan uh, uh, approval from the Canadians. We have uh, the U.S. Exim Bank with more than $2 billion. We have the Saudi Investment Fund. We have India, who just approved a $100 million uh, special loan program for us. So it's such a diversified Very set of opportunities diversified. globally. So your argument really is that there's so much focus, for instance, on this U.S.-China dynamic, but in fact, all of these other things are developing around the world. At so a rapid pace. At a rapid pace. And there's new opportunities that are, that are coming up around the world. And if you check our portfolio, uh, we have maybe the most diversified portfolio now uh, of companies uh, and, and for the first time. And, and I think that the decades of the, uh, the, decades of the aggressive work by the Chinese uh, and the message of that aggressive work, I think, has finally pushed out other stakeholders. So <clears throat> now we have, for example, for the first time, major trade missions from the uh, UK Embassy in Guyana, the High Commission in Guyana, the US Embassy in Guyana, the Canadians, uh, uh, so everyone now are now pushing ahead based on the opportunities. Sometimes I think uh, there is a 
you know, mismatch of interests. It, because we are so small, the, the, the private sector think that the market is so small. Why, why, why even uh, waste the time to, to, to look at that market? Build a hotel or... Uh, uh, yes. Well, yes. But they don't look at the collective as a whole and the type of opportunities in, in, in terms of future industries and, and, and so on. So this, we are seeing that change now. Uh, almost all the, the new hotels in Guyana are, are U.S. brands. That's not to say that uh, it's a competitive global environment. China will continue to push. And, and I think this, this competition globally allows uh, countries and, and the private sector to take a, a nuanced approach and to ensure that they are doing the best to get into the market. It also allows us to benefit from the most competitive rates and most competitive environment. Uh, and that is what we want at the end of the day. We are uh, in a competitive world and competitive environment. Guyana is open to all uh, partners. But if you look at the investment portfolio and you look at the, uh, the financing portfolio, you will see, and I'm not talking about the World Bank and, and, and the uh, IADB and, and, and so on. I'm just speaking about uh, more bilateral relationship, that there is uh, a misconception sometimes uh, and the, the, the facts does not add up to that misconception. Are you finding, and last, last question, um, Mr. President, are you finding that multilaterals are adjusting quickly to the rapid pace of change happening and are more relevant than ever before? Or are you, because the UN just hosted the Summit of the Future, which was an auspicious way to start uh, this year's UNGA UN General Assembly Week in New York. But, but are you finding these institutions designed to keep up with the rapid pace of change that you're encountering as a head of state? I think that there is tremendous reform that is needed. I don't think that the present system or structure can support, I wouldn't say the transformation, but if the, the, the present system uh, and structure cannot support the action that is needed uh, for, for, for the future. When we talk about the summit of the future, I mean, there are so many challenges that we have to address in the future, whether it's uh, AI and digitization that is going to create massive divide in the future, food insecurity, energy insecurity, energy poverty, climate, uh, uh, climate and biodiversity issues, uh, bringing a harmony, living in harmony, that is uh, people, planet, environment, uh, industries uh, living in harmony uh, with each other. Um, how do we ensure that all of this create uh, a balanced uh, play field uh, for all countries? So addressing these issues in the future and, and bridging all the inequality gaps and, and, and ensuring that, we, that the, the drive to renewable and clean energy does not further widen the gap in the haves and the haves not and, and, and building policies that support democracy, because we also need all the countries to understand that uh, democracy is no longer a choice and, 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 and democracy and the rule of law must be the foundation on which every economy is built. So how do we address all these challenges? How do we find <clears throat> global peace? How do we get to a peaceful world? How do we ensure that maybe uh, we cut back 1% of our military spending to go to poverty reduction globally. And these are the type of decisions. So it is not a summit, it's a, an action plan. What is that action plan? How is that action plan designed to bring the relevant reforms, uh, to create the changes that, is, that are needed, to make things implementable, to get things done, and to create this uh, harmony and coexistence uh, of, the, of the planet and people. Mr. President, thank you very, very much for joining the Swift Hour, and, and welcome back to Concordia, your home. Thank you very much. It's always a, a, a great honor to be here and to be with you, and I look forward to taking the work of Guyana and the role Guyana is playing uh, with Concordia long into the future and to, for us to have this global alliance on biodiversity uh, up and running. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.